Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, morning session um, on Open Forum on the role of the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa in the internet ecosystem in Africa. I'm Ponsle Tilology from the Gambia NRI Joko Labs, and I'll be moderating this session. And um, before we get started, I will just um, want all my um, speakers to introduce themselves, and we'll get started. I'll start with my honorable MP um, from the Gambia, Hala Jumbo. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Pons. My name is Honorable Allah Jimbo, uh, Member of Parliament from the Gambia, and also the um, co-founder and vice chair of um, African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. Uh, okay, my name is Sorina Safa, and I'm internet governance and cybersecurity expert for UNECA. Good morning, my name is uh, uh, Dr. Maktar Sek. I'm the chief of Technology and Innovation at UNECA. I'm also the coordinator of the Center of Excellence on Digital ID, Digital Threat, and Digital Economy. Good morning. My name is Oni Kamakwakwa, Executive Director of the Global Digital Inclusion Partnership. Thank you um, very much. Um, as you can see, all my panelists are very um, African-centric, and I will start with our um, parliamentarian, um, with um, in starting this discussion. I mean, since um, the African NRIs developed um, from around 2009, we then had um, the UNECA coming up, um, working with the African Union to set up the African Internet Governance Forum. And it has been growing and growing. We now have a lot of um, countries involved um, through the PREDA project, um, a, a project that was done between the European Union and um, the African Union Commission. The parliamentarian network in Africa has been, uh, has been growing since um, Addis Ababa, and it will be great to hear what Halaji has to say about within the internet ecosystem, what parliamentarians can do. And th this is very important because we still have less than 20 countries that have signed up to the uh, Malabo Convention, um, Gambia being the um, recent one um, that was done at the sidelines of the um, global IGF in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. So Halaji, let's hear your perspective on the role of parliamentarians, how you people can drive um, policy within a, a very inclusive um, internet ecosystem in the continent using the platform of the IGF. Halaji. Um, th thank you very much, um, Pons. Um, I think um, um, it is a known fact that um, um, EC actually has been supporting a um, lot of member states um, to ensure that they bridge the digital gap that we actually have in terms of um, helping in the formulating of the digital you know, transformation and also capacity building, et cetera. Now, um, the members of parliament actually have started also to, to be engaged um, in, the, in the IGF um, uh, since Addis. And right now, in fact, uh, it has solidified um, our network, which is the uh, parliamentary network. And uh, we work closely to ensure that we look at really where parliamentarians come in, in terms of um, helping in the, some of the policies. Um, uh, because parliamentarians normally don't actually do the policies, but they work with the executive to ensure those policies work in terms of legislation, um, in terms of budgeting, et cetera, et cetera. So now um, uh, we are working very closely. Now, in terms of also looking at the, the African Union various conventions relating to the internet, um, uh, particularly on cybersecurity and personal data protection, um, we are also pushing our own countries to ensure that they, they, they signed because of a um, lot of countries still now have some laws that are really very vague and really not very clear. And some actually, um, they're handling um, most of these things using the um, Communication Act of their countries. Like in Gambia, we have the um, Information and Communication Act of 2009, which is not really um, um, very conducive to also fight um, cyber crimes. So members of parliament actually are pushing to ensure that their countries actually signed um, uh, those protocols um, uh, of the African Union. And uh, right now, I think in the Gambia was among the, the last countries actually to sign, and, and uh, we're going to get the ratification most likely this year in parliament. So what we are trying to do actually is to actually align um, some of those protocols to um, the international standards. And uh, already, various parliaments actually have, have done that. Like the Gambia, for example, right now, um, they've already developed 
um, uh, the cybersecurity bill, they've also developed the personal data protection, which is actually crucial. If you look at the, um, the malware protocol that like we call um, on the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection, it has given certain criteria that countries must abide by in terms of um, setting up those um, institutions that's going to handle um, cyber issues and also to protect data, because data actually is, is everything on the internet right now. And uh, again, um, if you look at the African continent, we are a little bit behind in terms of protecting our own data and also owning our own data, which is very, very important. Um, because data is actually, you know, money. So uh, members of parliament, we are working together with our executive to ensure that they, they, we support their transformation agenda. Um, that is actually bridging the gap in terms of um, uh, the digital divide, in terms of capacity building, um, also in terms of uh, legislation, the laws, and also one of the most important thing also in identification. Because again, the ecosystem, we must be able to identify people. We must also be able to identify um, their addresses, which is actually um, one of the biggest issues we have in the continent here. I think over 400 million people in the, on the continent now can, cannot be, um, you know, cannot have proper um, ID system. So uh, members of parliament, we are working very closely with um, the assistance from uh, the ECA and our governments to ensure that we get this, you know, on track. And from there, we move on to, you know, to other areas. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Halaji and Book, for that um, um, very useful um, information. Uh, meaningful connectivity has been crucial for driving internet access and developing the um, internet ecosystem in Africa. We saw what a lot of African countries went through during the COVID. A lot of our children were basically at home for a long time. I think in Uganda had the record over one year, um, Ugandan children couldn't go to school. In talking about meaningful connectivity, we are very lucky here. We have um, Onika, um, whose organization, the Global Digital Inclusion Partnership, really focuses on meaningful connectivity, and um, especially in the global south. And if we have to move from the point we are now, whereby we still have not up to 50% of the continent online, even though we have 80% that are on voice mobile, Connectivity is very important. So, Nick, it would be very good to hear your perspective, how you see uh, meaningful connectivity can accelerate the growth of our ecosystem within the internet and especially, especially driving our young people to be more creative because they are the digital natives of our continent and they make up over 60% of the population. Great, uh, thank you. Thanks, uh, Pancelet. So, you know, given the vision that Africa has uh, set for itself in terms of, uh, you know, the digital transformation strategy for Africa, it's really important that we look beyond basic connection, basic access, and really uh, take this as an opportunity for us to, others have said we are going to leapfrog or moonshot ourselves to the meaningful stage. But I think one of the things that has happened um, is that COVID-19 actu uh, actually exposed our very deep inequalities. Um, that we have imagined gaps, including of the, amongst those who are already connected, thus making a basic connection no longer um, a good standard for us to follow. So what actually needs to happen? Um, the first thing we need to address is the issue of infrastructure. Um, I know that uh, the mobile operator sector is telling us a lot about a usage gap that is uh, developing and growing uh, in the region, meaning that there's more people who are living within a broadband connection but are not necessarily using it. But we still have a lot of areas that don't have any coverage at all. And so, uh, you know, addressing the infrastructure investment, creating an, an environment uh, for private sector investment, but also understanding that it's going to take more than just private sector. Uh, the Moonshot report estimated that we need $109 billion uh, in infrastructure investment for Africa. Government has to also come uh, to invest and, and provide some resources into this. 
as well as our development partners and uh, other private public uh, partnerships that uh, we need to, to look at. So continue to invest on infrastructure, really important to make sure we are connecting everyone. But as we do so, uh, let us use the meaningful connectivity standard. I think one of the things that has been disappointing is that we continuously talk about meaningful connectivity, but we have divorced it from what is that standard of meaningful connectivity. Uh, we're talking about having an adequate speed for people to do the things that are envisioned uh, in this digital transformation strategy where we are going to have a digital economy, uh, e-learning that is continuous. It requires a speed of at least four, four, four uh, gig speed, right? So looking at making sure that we are investing uh, in that. It requires people have, having smartphones uh, or at least a minimum uh, device that is a smart device. Uh, at the moment in Africa, our biggest challenge with smart devices is the cost. Affordability is really uh, an issue. We are spending, uh, at least people in the low income quantiles are spending 40 to 60% of average household income to purchase one smart device uh, in a household. So we need to address uh, devices. Uh, and there's various areas where we need to, to strengthen. One of those is digital taxation. Um, removing uh, or reducing some of the taxation that burdens uh, the sector, especially taxes that are consumer facing, with the understanding that we will increase uptake of uh, digital technologies that then will benefit uh, the economy and you know that loss in taxes for now will actually be a gain in uh, the digital uh, financial activity uh, in the future. We need to make sure that people have daily access. At the moment, we are still defining a connected person in most of the research uh, and in our global standards. We are defining a connected person as someone who accesses the internet once every three months. That is unacceptable. We need to uh, work towards daily access and unlimited data. Affordability is a big issue. And so, you know, we need to be also be open to public access in order to supplement uh, the access that people are having to purchase on their own. But hopefully we'll have a chance to talk a little bit more about what has worked in driving uh, affordability in the region. A few countries have actually reached the one for two uh, affordability standard, while many, many, many more uh, still have not. Thank you. Thank you very much. As you rightly said, we are going to do a deep dive into it. Um, youth has been very important in our work um, within our national IGF processes. Um, Surin here has been doing a lot of work in empowering African youths. It will be good to hear from you how you see our youths, what they play, the role they play in driving the national IGF processes, and what more can be done with them. Right now, presently in this particular 18 global IGF, we, most of the young people that came from the African continent were came through support from GIZ. We still need to get more of our youths here. Most of them are really involved within our internet societies, our national processes. So the, um, as your focus on youth um, within the IGF process, how do you think we can improve on it and get their voices more heard? Uh, thank you, Pons, uh, for the question. I think uh, the youth issue in Africa, we can look at it from the bigger angle. Uh, I'm, uh, if I need to speak on the youth, I want to refer back to the global IGF that we did in 2022. Um, I was the coordinator of the youth uh, during that forum. Um, under the ECA, the leadership of uh, MACTA, what we uh, tried to do uh, during that time is, the first issue was African representation in this kind of either global or even continental discussions. So we say that if we want to grow the African participation, the starting point would have been the youth. So uh, you mentioned now uh, we have uh, around maybe 10 or to 20 youth represented here but Africa majority of the population is youth. And how do we expand the youth participations and instead of having the same youth being represented all over the place? So what we decided to do is having a distributed um, 
a representation of youth from the five region. Africa has five regions, the north, the south, the east, the west, and Central Africa. So under ECA, we sponsored 80 youth during uh, the global uh, IGF. Uh, we didn't just sponsor them for them to be in the global IGF discussion, but for them to be embedded on the IGF process. In order for us to do that, they had to go through internet governance training program, which we collaborated with the African Union and uh, in PRIDA initiative, they had one week internet governance uh, training program on the founding uh, principle, economic, legal, policy, or even activism in internet governance, because what we wanted to do is the conversation to continue. Internet governance forum is not just a forum, it's just a process. So it's not something ends as soon as the forum concludes. So how do we, in, I think, broaden the African uh, internet governance ecosystem without uh, giving them the necessary tool? That's why the training program was part of the youth <coughs> initiative, not just sponsoring them to the global IGF. After the training, uh, the youth was divided based on the skills they had. Some of them, they were volunteering in a rapporteur service, some of them in webcasting, some of them on technical infrastructure, which we had to collaborate with the global IGF secretariat and they went through the training program. And uh, uh, I think uh, some of them also being involved in the conferencing services, how to organize. Because what we wanted to do is, as soon as the 80 volunteer went through this process, can they go back support at the, the national or regional uh, IGF processes, wherever they are? So that's what uh, the whole aim was. Uh, ECA didn't do it alone. ECA uh, set up a tax force uh, team, which incorporated the five regions who are very active, internet governance convener. Uh, Ponsolate was the chair. Mama Mary was also a representative West Africa. Uh, Michelle, uh, the Central African IGF was a convener, just to give a broader perspective because they have uh, quite knowledgeable uh, when it comes to their own region. So the youth representation was the core of ECA's internet governance mission. How do we create internet governance ecosystem that truly reflect our continent? So uh, all in all, um, if I go back, what we have achieved, the 80 volunteers, um, 30 of them were from Ethiopia. Ethiopia never hold a national IGF. But now, if you go back and check, Ethiopia even set up a youth IGF, which the, uh, the, even the person who lead that initiative was part of those IGF uh, process. Even the members used to be the ECA volunteers. That was the success uh, item that we can identify. It's not just being part of the conference services, but how do we really carry them along the way? Uh, we have also new initiative in the continent, for example, the Pan-African Youth Ambassador. Most of our facilitators and volunteers came in from those youth uh, uh, initiative that ECA has done. So what we are saying is, how do you see the vision? The vision is try to integrate the youth uh, along the way of the internet governance process, not just the, the final conference, either at the continental or regional level. We've started it, but our goal is to expand uh, this initiative as we go along. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, um, Sorin, for that um, detailed um, explanation of um, what the youth did and especially the process um, um, ECA initiated. Um, in Addis Ababa last year during the 17th Global Internet Governance Forum. Um, this round of questions, I will end with Dr. Matak Sek. Um, ECA initiated the first African Internet Governance Forum over a decade ago, if I can remember very well, in Nairobi. Um, it was a very small number, less than 20% um, of the um, countries were there. In Addis Ababa, we still, um, sorry, in Nigeria, the last um, African Internet Governance Forum, we still had less than 30 countries represented. Um, represented. If you look um, at the whole, whole dynamics, we need to get our 54 member states to be having national processes, and ECA 
is very important in this role as you um, initiated it. So how do you how do you see the ECA regalvanizing the IGF? We are going to um, our national process. Um, um, bottom top and getting more countries um, to be involved in the continent in, in, in within it, not only um, about it, but also using the African IGF to drive our policy process. Um, I just want to welcome our Minister of State from Ethiopia for Digital Economy, um, Honorable um, Uri Ali. Thank you for coming to attend this session, and she'll make a brief remark later on. Thank you. Makta, yeah. Thank you, Chair, and welcome uh, to the Minister to this important uh, uh, session. But let's to go back uh, maybe uh, 20 years ago. In uh, 2006, uh, it is a year where IGF Internet Governance Forum was uh, created. Why it was created? At this time, uh, African country or middle or low income country does, uh, doesn't have the same equal voice to discuss the issue of internet or digital technology across the world. All discussion were led by Western or North country to decide uh, what, what we need, what African country needs. And the solution proposed are not adequate with the African need. And why uh, the WCS, uh, what, one key outcome of the WCS uh, 2005 was the creation of uh, Internet Governance Forum, where everybody can have an equal exchange to discuss on their concern, make a proposal, is why IGF, it is a multi-stakeholder forum. And the first IGF was, uh, was held in uh, Athens in 2006, and today we are at the 18th uh, Global IGF Forum, and the IGF will be end by 20, 2025. Maybe the, the General Assembly will renew for 2030. And for this ECA, uh, play an important role to set up an African IGF, because uh, we, we can discuss uh, at the global level, but we need to start the discussion at the internet, at the continental level. Because uh, when you remember in 2006, uh, the access internet in the continent was very, very low. It was 2.6%. Uh, at this time, uh, the, in Europe, it was 39%. And we have, uh, and we need to have an inclusive information society to bring uh, the idea of all stakeholders, government, private sector, civil society, academia, to discuss the way we can build African information society more inclusive in order to take benefits of this uh, digital sector. And why ECA in 2011, you, you remind uh, initiated the African Internet Governance Forum in Kenya. And uh, since uh, I think we have uh, seen uh, this uh, African Internet Governance growing, we fo following the discussion of uh, the several s stakeholders, now uh, our internet access is increased. We, have, we are at, we, 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 we go from uh, 2.6 in 2005 to 40% in 2022. We have a lot of progress that which even we have to do better. And ECA also continue to support this African Internet Governance Forum. We set up a secretariat and to make all stakeholders in the continent and the organization, we share the secretariat with African Union Commission. And since uh, this, uh, we work together to organize this African Internet Governance Forum, and we organize uh, open requests in uh, member's country each year, and we have uh, seen uh, some lot of progress since 2011. And the last one you, you, you highlight very well, it was uh, one organized in Abuja in uh, September, I think, and where we have uh, very good attendance, more 3,500 people, 
and uh, around 20 sessions discuss all the issue of uh, Internet uh, Governance Forum. We'll continue also this momentum to support this uh, initiative because we discuss a lot with the all stakeholders to see how we can make better this uh, African Internet Governance Forum. But we, but we have seen uh, there are some gaps we have to, to sort it out. When you look at the African participation in the Global Internet Governance Forum, it's very low. Compare last year, last year in, uh, in Ethiopia, and I would like to thank you, government Ethiopia also for the well organization of the Internet Governance Forum last year, because it was a big challenge for Africa. ECA fight a lot with the UN organization to get this uh, 17 IGF in Africa. And it, is, it was the third time we organized the global IGF in the continent. And uh, I think it, well, it was well organized. And we, the attendance was very well and also very relevant in terms of content and discussion. And we had a lot of participation from African country. The issue is we have to maintain this. But uh, unfortunately, we are few here in, uh, in Japan. And at the ministerial level also, I think uh, it, we have two ministers from the continent here. And we need to change this uh, paradigm. How we change it to better organize uh, our, uh, our mag, 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 mag and also our secretariat uh, in order to involve more participants in the global IGF process. We set up a task force uh, yesterday to discuss and to propose a way to improve African participation in the African IGF, also in the global uh, IGF. We need also, uh, we are going also to support African uh, uh, stakeholders, not just to attend IGF as participant, but to be involved we need to, next year, to have more session drive by African participant. Also, we need to have more African in the several sessions to discuss about issues regarding uh, Africa. We can't talk about uh, digital public infrastructure. You have several sessions, they talk about digital infrastructure. We need to have African country, African representative in this session. When we, when, when we, when we talk about this internet fragmentation, we have a lot of things to say, uh, given the current situation of Afrinic in the continent. We need to also to have African uh, country representative in this session. When you talk about this emerging technology, generative IE, it is a African, it is a future for the world with 70% of youth in 2015. And we need to have our voice eh, to say what are our perspective. When you talk about the global digital compact, the, the future we want, we need African voice. Why uh, we are going to propose a program to support African country to be, when we talk about cyber security also, it is important to talk about uh, the issue of uh, the concern of Africa because we are losing 10% of our GDP. It's not only 10% of our GDP because we have a lot of problem, security problem around the, the continent. In West Africa, in Central Africa, with this uh, group terrorists, uh, we need uh, to protect also our citizens. It is uh, some key uh, area where we need to improve our participation in this uh, global IGF. ECA will support African country to attend and also to be involved in all this, uh, uh, this uh, session to be organized in uh, the next two Internet Governance Forum 2024 in Saudi Arabia. And I think 2025, the country is not yet uh, decided. Sec third point, we need also, we have also a, pro a capacity building program. We acknowledge the participation of our parliamentarian in the, in the IGF process with the creation of uh, African Parliament uh, Network for Internet Governance, APNIC. And we are going to propose a, pr a, a capacity building program for the parliamentarian. To, to improve their knowledge and skill 
on the issue of uh, internet governance or in the digital technology also. Even this uh, capacity building program will be open to, um, to all, ma pro all political making decisions, all the govern government member. And I, I, and, uh, I think uh, after that, the government will be more aware, African government will be more aware on the interest of the Internet Governance Forum. And, and uh, I, I'm sure next year we'll get more ministers to, to attend the African Internet Governance Forum as well as the Global Governance Forum in Saudi Arabia. Also, we don't forget the community, the technical community. We have also a capacity building program for the technical community to support them to discuss on the technical critical issue related to Internet Governance Forum. The issue of DNS, of CCLT, T internet fragmentation. We have all, uh, all this program uh, to be open as a 24 to all African co community. Also, uh, we, the, the youth participation is very important. Uh, last year, we did well. We bring uh, around 80 youth. I think Soren already highlighted uh, the youth participation last year. But this year, we didn't do well. And uh, we make sure next year we'll bring more youth in the global IGF. And also, if there is uh, any idea, any proposal, are welcome at uh, ECA. We can uh, discuss to s and ECA and AUC to see how we are going to improve our participation. The, the chair of the task force is uh, Honorable uh, Elijah Jimbo for to improve uh, the African participation on IGF. If you have any idea, uh, please share with him. And uh, AUC and uh, ECA will sit together to see how the, the best way to handle uh, this uh, African IGF uh, uh, process. To conclude, before to conclude, I would like to thank all. Uh, we have a lot of people here work hard. Huh? Since the beginning of uh, IGF, uh, I would like to, uh, to thank Mary. Mary, she's there since long time, she's supporting uh, this uh, process. We have all the, the second generation, uh, eh? uh, Jimson, <laughs> you. Eh? <laughs> it's not old, yeah. <laughs> the first generation is Mary, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Supporting, and we have also the young generation, Dr. Kosi, all these people coming now, and Michelle. Mm? <laughs> you are here to support the process since a long time, voluntary. And uh, we'll uh, thank you again for all the support you provide, uh, not to ECA, but it's to the African community. And I think uh, we have to say, to tell you, thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Magda, for that um, in, um, great intervention about um, the role of ECA and how we can galvanize our community, especially getting our ministers um, very involved. That's why, personally, I know our Honorable Minister of State for Digital Economy in Ethiopia has a busy schedule, but she took time to come for this um, session. So, Honorable Huria Ali, we, are, we appreciate um, you coming. And I'll move to the second question now, and I'll start with, with um, the second round of questions, then we'll get um, intervention from the audience, and we have someone online, um, um, a young person who will also intervene. Um, Onika, if you look at the growth um, from 2.6%, almost 3% in 2006, when we had the first um, global IGF in Antes, just after the World Summit of Information um, in um, Tunis. And now we are talking of 2022, um, we have about 44% internet penetration in the continent. Cost has been a factor in that. Um, I can give an example, the average in, in Gambia, the average cost for one gigabyte of data is about $5. The best average um, around around the continent is about $2. And um, Ghana and Cabo Verde, um, Tunisia, having one of the um, lowest cost of internet. What do you think we can do to improve cost? A lot of African countries now are now through um, bilateral and international organizations are now investing more in um, submarine cables, but is that enough? Um, yes, absolutely. So cost has been um, a, a huge challenge in the region. 
Uh, the ITU, the global standard for affordability is uh, one for two, meaning one gig of data at no more than 2% average monthly income. But I'm sure you'll all agree with me that um, even that is still, in fact, many countries in Africa still do not meet that average standard. Um, not only is the average standard uh, that we have right now also in, inadequate, it's, it's just not meeting a lot of our, our people. And that's largely because of two things. One is that one gig of data per month is not sufficient for us to do the kinds of things that we are talking about when we talk about meaningful connectivity. But two, uh, the 2% 2 average monthly income is actually, f even for those countries that do meet this, uh, I'll give South Africa as a good example, they are only meeting it for the top 20% income earners because of the inequalities that exist within the country. Those who are at the bottom 40%, and that's true for Ghana as well, the bottom 40% are still paying more than 2% of average monthly income. So there's several things that we've done working with different uh, countries on affordability, uh, especially on the policy and regulatory uh, framework side. One is uh, promoting uh, market competition, which is one of the things in uh, the uh, digital transformation strategy for Africa. Uh, really working on, on market uh, you know, competition, a lot of our economies tend to be duopolies right now. Um, you know, so we need to really work on uh, bringing more actors into uh, the space and having an enabling uh, reg regulation to actually allow them to be able to enter. At some point, we have to recognize that there are people who might never even afford the 2%. And this is where public access options come in, but also where community networks come in. We, we've reached a point in Africa where we, we've tested many community networks and the model is working. Uh, it's testing at different digital technologies as well as a different financial model. Uh, communities that actually are operating community networks also have a much higher meaningful conne connectivity score, which includes digital skills, use uh, for things that help people improve their lives. So perhaps it is time for us on the regulatory side to talk about how do we promote regulations that actually enable community networks to close the gaps in a way that is affordable uh, in those other communities. The other uh, policy that is also in the strategy is infrastructure sharing. So one of the great things about this continent is that uh, we are very enthusiastic about adopting policies uh, that uh, are going to lead to the kind of change that we, we want. Where the challenge has been, has been on implementation. So for the longest time, we've talked about infrastructure sharing within the sector and across utilities. Um, we've actually worked with Mozambique as an, a good example where we've actually developed a policy and they've had regulations adopted. But four years later, they are still in the process of harmonizing the policies in order for them to implement. Same with Ghana. Policy exists, implementation, implementation not quite. Nigeria, policy exists. Implementation needs a little bit of review. I think we have to differentiate between co-locating and true infrastructure sharing. What we are not seeing is, is real infrastructure sharing uh, across utilities, especially with roads, with electricity, especially electricity, because we all know where there's no electricity, connectivity is, is, is a non-starter. I mean, we, we can't even get our connectivity. Uh, and lastly, we have to use our universal service funds in a way that enables us to close the gaps. Uh, one example, I, I like to, to challenge us, but also to show examples of where we are making a little bit of progress. Um, one example is West Africa. ECOWAS actually went through the process of reviewing universal service uh, policies, regulations, and legislation, and actually adopted a sub-regional uh, uh, legislation for universal, the Universal Service Act at the end of 2019 which was unanimously adopted by the member states of ECOWAS. Unfortunately, because of uh, COVID uh, happening immediately the next year, uh, it delayed the process for the member states to actually uh, begin to now review their own policies and laws uh, to make sure that they are compliant. But universal service funds are an opportunity uh, for us in Africa to close the digital divides. 
not only on rural and urban, but also begin to address the gender divide. I really like that Dr. Magda keeps reminding us about what we are losing in the economy. Uh, we did a study on the cost of exclusion, looking at what is costing governments to exclude women from digital development. Uh, and we looked at low middle income countries, uh, lower and middle income countries. And uh, we uh, came up with a, an economic model that actually estimates that governments have lost about a trillion dollars from uh, excluding women in the digital economy. We then did a deep dive in West Africa and looked at several countries in West Africa to look at uh, the economic impact of this exclusion by, by being able to tell a story of what women are able to accomplish when they, when they are enabled to be uh, online. You know, they are able to run their businesses during lockdown in particular, we, did, uh, we took a look at COVID-19 to look at women who, are connect, who were connected during that time and how they were affected in terms of loss of income. And uh, research is evident. It, show, it tells us that those women who had access to connectivity were able to weather the loss of income and be able to move and pivot uh, to be able to uh, produce online, to take a course online, to apply for a job online, uh, things that they are not able to do. So I think I will conclude by saying, uh, for us now, what we really need to also marry is the fact that we need evidence-based, uh, we need to do research so that our policy making is based on research and evidence learnings uh, that, that we have. And I say this because we also have seen some poor practices of adopting digital taxation from other jurisdictions by only simply looking at this country introduced this new tax and they gained so much money during this period. But what we don't actually look at is what effect did that digital taxation do on affordability and our goal to actually meet affordability. Digital taxation for the most part has been predominantly consumer facing. Uh, and we need to really review it. Uh, we looked at Nigeria, and actually we developed an infographic on Nigeria. And at the time, there were 27 unique taxes, in, you know, from SIM registration, uh, tr electronic transaction. There's now a pending communication service tax of 9%. All of those things actually forestall our growth uh, in terms of achieving this goal of affordability. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Anika. And I, I, I like the way you dived into the policy aspects whereby some are there, some are not there. They are either half baked, fully baked, but still not implemented. So I'll go back to um, Halaji Umbu. Um, especially in relating to policy, and we look at our energy solutions. During the first um, inaugural African um, Climate Summit in early September, um, President um, William Rutu of um, Kenya, who um, said that the continent has abundant sun, we have wind, and we have uh, green minerals. So we can be a solution for providing energy to the world. That's what he said. And um, we are heading into the um, COP28 in, in the United Arab Emirates in um, December. And we have to look at first, before we start providing energy to the world, we have to provide energy to ourselves and with these um, abundant resources we have. So I would like to hear from you, uh, looking at the policy aspects, um, members of parliament, you, 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 um, you pass all these bills, of what do you think as parliamentarians you can do better in terms of, ad because you address energy issues, you automatically address, um, in a way, cost of connectivity, because our um, um, some years back you will see um, countries were having 8,000 generators, um, just uh, mobile companies, just to power um, their cell towers. So imagine if you don't have any generators and all those were powered by, um, solar energy, what that can do to bring down costs. So, Halaji, over to you on this policy aspect. Yeah, um, th thank you very much, um, Pons. Um, I think generally um, there's a direct correlation between the cost of data and the cost of operation by these um, GSM companies. Um, because they are there to make money, so um, all the infrastructure they need in terms of electricity, in terms of the equipment they need, the cost of that actually also has a direct correlation with the cost of the data. Now, when you look at, um, um, like, um, I quite agree with um, Onika when he said, um, uh, you know, 
um, uh, things that ne things need to be done, for example, to help to reduce, uh, you know, co-location and also, you know, sharing of infrastructure, which, which are two fundamental things to actually to help. Um, because when you look at it in general, um, um, uh, and this also has to go with policy change. Now, um, for example, um, um, right now in Gambia, what we are doing, we are working with um, um, the regulator actually is trying to work with the companies uh, to see how best they can help to reduce um, uh, the cost. Now, as members of parliament, because I also happen to be the chair of the committee responsible for education and ICT, um, uh, in the next few days, we'll be calling, uh, we'll be visiting the GSM companies, all of them in the country, um, together with the um, ministry and also as well as the uh, regulator to see exactly what we can do together. Now, what is clear actually is that the lack of electricity actually across the continent, uh, more so in Gambia actually, is also impacting on the provision of the services because of, again, like you said, they would have to use um, uh, solar um, to be able to, or generators to be able to power their, you know, infrastructure, um, uh, you, you know, and that makes it actually more expensive because you have to turn on the generator almost um, 12 hours in the day because during the day you can use the sun to power some of your equipment. Now, um, there are additional things that we need to look at as far as policy is concerned. What can we do uh, in terms of, um, um, you know, using policies to encourage or to ask them to work together? You know, in Gambia, for example, I give another example. Like what the government did is they built the national broadband network. Uh, that's actually owned by the government. Then they would allow the private sector to be able to connect on that network instead of them building their own. Because if they build their own, which means totally their operational cost also is going to go up. So now the government make it a deliberate strategy to build the national, the national broadband network, then this private sector can come and connect. But the, it's not fully operational because of we still dealing with the last mile um, to be able to connect. Now, the other area also that um, as far as policy is concerned is we got to make, um, make it easy for the new entrants in the market. Because if you go to across the continent also, most of the country when you go, there's a dominance about two or three companies that dominate the entire market. Now, what can government do to ensure that we, we, we make it easy for the new entrants? Now, to do that, I think um, uh, there's a, there should be a deliberate strategy to create some kind of tax haven for them to, to, to be able to come in. Because they cannot just come immediately and then start to compete. Because these are people that are established almost 5, 10, or 20 years ago. So you, don't, you cannot come now and then you want to compete with them. So their policies must be geared towards making it easy for them to, to enter the market um, in terms of tax breaks um, and also in terms of making it easy um, in terms of providing electricity also. Now, the other one, uh, the last one is also about the, the electricity. I'll come back to that one again. That is, we need to be, if you want to, um, you know, f end internet poverty, we also need to look at our electricity supply across the continent because that's also a very big factor. Um, now, in the, in the Gambia exam, I always give an example. Um, the, also, the government came out with also another um, project um, that would connect electricity, solar, to all schools, um, to all hospitals across the country. And you know when that actually happens, which means now the GSM company will be able to also operate in those areas. So lastly, like um, Onika actually said, it's about the need to also promote um, you know, community networks. Um, they are very cheap to deploy, and they are also very quick also to deploy. It doesn't really need huge um, infrastructural investment. It doesn't need that. So our policies as members of parliament, we need to actually help the executive in those policies uh, where we can actually help them to, 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 to make the policies where it's going to uh, make it easy for new entrants to come into the market and also to ensure we have enough electricity supply across the country and also to um, ensure that um, the tax breaks actually are given to the new entrants so that they can compete with the bigger, big, bigger boys in the market. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alaji. Before I round up this session with um, Sorin and Makta, I will open it up now to the floor for questions. And um, if we, we have someone online, please, um, our um, technical folks, if there's someone online, please um, let us know for him to ask questions. So please, uh, the floor is opened. And um, after all the questions, um, I'll, before I round up, I will allow our, our honorable minister present to just say a brief comment before um, Sorin and Makta um, close it. So please, the mic is there, and we'll, we'll take some questions now. Please introduce yourself and um, the constituency you represent. Yeah. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Emmanuel Vitus. I'm the convener of the Togo IGF and the coordinator of the West African School of Internet Governance. 
So first of all, congratulations to the EUC and the ECA for their commendable work. I think uh, since at this we have observed the involvement of the youth in the community. So my question is directed to Soren. Uh, my first question is how the national IGFs are involved in the recruitment of those young individuals and what mechanism has put in place to measure their impact after the fellowship at the national and regional level. The second question is um, could you elaborate on the collaboration between the national and regional school in the recruitment engagement of uh, those young people? And my last question is what is the message uh, that is being conveyed to this global stage by those young people because we have observed that other countries that actually sponsor their youth to participate in this meeting, they make sure that they attend all the meetings or have a representative in all those meetings with one message. So they always convey the message of their country or their region to all those sessions. So is there any mechanism like that for the African youth to make sure that they participate in all the sessions here and bring our message to the global stage so that this meeting is not just uh, a meeting great between them. So my last question is about inclusion. Uh, we noticed that we have 29 French speaking countries and about six Portuguese speaking countries. And among those youth, do you take that into consideration to make sure that language is not a barrier in the participation of the French speaking and the Portuguese or Arabic speaking uh, young participant. Thank you. Um, those, 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 you really bundled up a lot of questions, but I'll, we'll, we'll, I'll go over to the ne I'll go over to the next um, the next question. So, after the three questions on this side, I'll allow the audience, um, my um, um, panelists, to respond, and then we'll take the questions on this side. So, I'll, oh, okay, I will take all. Okay, ne ne next, please. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Yuneka, for what you are doing. I know you have been doing uh, the... Please introduce the yourself. For, for oh, okay. Uh, sorry. My, uh, my name is uh, Naza Nicholas Kirama. I currently serve as the president of uh, Internet Society Tanzania chapter and also the um, national IGF uh, coordinator. Uh, I have two uh, interventions. Number one... Uh, is uh, really to thank you, Neka, for what you are doing. Uh, on the language front, I know um, Soreen has been very instrumental in terms of uh, making sure we expand uh, the inclusion in terms of, in terms of languages. Uh, as you know, 58% uh, of, the, of the content uh, on the internet is English, and not so many people around the world, you know, speak English. So I think, uh, uh, I thank you for that. Number two, uh, I really want to give an example of uh, uh, what is happening in Tanzania. Uh, I know United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, uh, we're talking about the economy, and now we're talking about a modern economy that is driven by uh, a digital economy. And uh, without uh, electricity uh, in the rural areas, uh, if we are talking about the digital Africa, I think somehow it will be a mission impossible. So I want to share an example that has been done in Tanzania for the last uh, uh, seven or six years. Uh, when uh, President Magufuli got into the power, uh, we had uh, uh, 6,000 villages without uh, electricity. But in short three years, he managed to uh, install, um, put up uh, electricity in 3,000 villages. So what does this say? This means that uh, if we really uh, uh, have a political will and we decide it can be done. That means even other countries can be able to, to do that to ensure that uh, we have electricity in the rural areas so we can uh, secure our, uh, the future of digital Africa. So that is what I wanted to share uh, to say that uh, it, is, it is possible and it can be done if everybody plays his or her part. Thank Th you. Thank you. Yeah. 
please um, try to make your comments brief. We have um, some um, few minutes more, so we can get everybody to speak. Okay. Uh, my name is Jim Sinulufuyu, uh, Africa, private sector, Africa. Also, to join others to say thank you to UNECA for what they've been doing, especially through uh, Dr. Mata Seik. Uh, the private sector in the global south, especially Africa, is really underrepresented compared to the global north. Global north is matured, okay? Of course, we know, we understand that. So in the south, we try to organize ourselves, but it's really challenging, so we want to call for uh, more engagement, more participation uh, or support from uh, UNECA. Uh, we recognize the critical role of UNECA, especially uh, from, uh, through the effort of our late brother, Makan Faye, blessed memory, and of course with uh, Mark Tessek, as I mentioned, and the team. Well, Mark, uh, UNECA has a, a strong instrument now in terms of uh, a study that shows clearly that when we deploy internet fully, we can really have per capita you know, GDP increase, very clear measure. So my appeal is that we should engage our government more, let them see that this add value to the economy will be of their people. Because I see, see some government, they don't get it. I was discussing with a colleague, and I was surprised that uh, some government would deliberately shut down the, the internet just because they, they didn't agree with some social media uh, post. And then, uh, after I need to mention that the use of TV white spaces is very important because in Africa we have dispersed areas, okay? So uh, the established telco might not be able to reach those places because of obvious reasons, but with uh, spectrum for TV white spaces freely given, uh, that will really help a lot. Solar panel is being used to power uh, data centers uh, around. We have demonstrated it. So uh, let's go uh, solar. And uh, lastly, one network, how can we achieve that? We want to uh, encourage UNECA to really help push this so that we can have one network uh, across Africa. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Please, I appeal to you to raise your question. Mama Mary, please, over to thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mary Uduma. Uh, I coordinate the West Africa Internet Governance Forum. I'm part of the National Nigeria Internet Governance Forum, and uh, I'm the... I just uh, handed over the, the chairpersonship of Africa Internet Governance Forum to Lillian. So um, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of uh, the internet governance in Africa. I know when we started very small, and now we have grown. Uh, Abuja was uh, like a boom for us. So oh, thank you for your support, ECA, and what you have been doing. The two, the, what I want us to see is that our governments I'm not sure, I don't know the government that is really, has, has really catched, uh, no, caught the, the fever of internet governance or understand what multi-stakeholder uh, uh, approach is. Um, there are a few here in the program, I mean the IGF today, I mean 2023 IGF, I don't know how many ministers, apart from our minister that is seated in the front, I don't know how many ministers. So I want to uh, ask what strategy uh, would um, ECA deploy to make sure that, well, in coordination with Africa Union, because I, Africa Union stands in, in, has the privilege of getting, getting the ministers or getting the heads of state uh, come to, to their meeting. What strategy will be put in place to make sure that uh, our ministers are capacitated, like we are doing capacity of our parliamentarians, because those are the people that do the policy. Those are the people that, they prefer to go to ITU. Uh, how would the, what role will ECA play to make sure that these ministers get to understand what the internet, internet governance um, will portend for us in Africa? That's one. Second one, sorry if, I, if I'm getting it uh, too long. Second one is when we say that we want to strengthen the internet governance at the global level, can we define it from our own level, what it means to strengthen the internet governance? 
Um, at the global level, you might say the secretariat is not strong, and you know there are people that are still excluded in internet governance. So what will be our own strategy to make sure that we also strengthen the, the we also contribute to the strengthening of the internet governance at global level? Thank you. Okay, next. Thank you very much and good morning to everybody. I would also try to be um, very short. My name is Modesto Samtse uh, from the Republic of Namibia and a member of APNEC as well as member of parliament. Uh, number one is youth involvement into activities like this one. Uh, I really want to appreciate the previous speakers who have uh, uh, highlighted the importance of youth participation into uh, internet governance activities because these are the future generation for Africa. And I just think that as we go back and plan further, we should really try to get them on board as much as we can so that we can drive the work on together. Uh, I believe the, the aspect is also uh, much, much higher. And if we can capacitate them to take over I think uh, for tomorrow, that would be a good journey. Uh, the other one is um, sharing of infrastructure. Sharing of infrastructure is really a problem which I don't know how we should legislate uh, because you, you have an institution that owns this infrastructure and they determine the renting cost if, if, if one is to, to rent a space on, on their towers, for instance. And uh, for new entrants, it become an issue because the new entrants are unable either to afford the price determined by the owner of the, the infrastructure that already exists. And now, as a legislator, I don't know how best we can uh, approach this so that we can give a direction. So the last one is uh, market saturation. Uh, with smaller populations like the one of Namibia, that's also an issue. I don't know how we can manage that one to allow new entrants in because those who are already there uh, are saying they are struggling to survive. So those were my short intervention. Thank, Thank you. you. Next. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm Honorable Lydia Lamisia Kamvarvan, a parliamentarian from Ghana and a member of APNIC. Um, I just want to find out, in um, my sister's presentation, she made mention of women who are at a disadvantage when it comes to the use of data and um, other internet services. It's true. In Africa, it's true. It's, 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 it's an open secret that it has been difficult for women, especially in the rural areas, to have that ability to use the internet. One, the, the provision of technology. The reason being that people at the rural um, um, areas don't have the needed resources to afford new technologies. Then two, the affordability of data in the rural areas. No matter how little it is, but it is still expensive to the rural woman. We as African parliamentarians and as women, women in leadership, what is or what are we doing as women to help our fellow women in the rural areas who are at a disadvantage? That is one of my questions. Then two, I want to find out what we as African parliamentarians or women in general taking as our take home from this Internet um, Governance Forum home to make sure that the, our fellow women in our various countries also benefit. It is not a talk shop that we come here and talk as women, we come here and talk and walk away. We need something to carry home 
to tell our fellow women that this is what we have learned and this is what we want them to be or this is what we want them to hear from what we have taken home to uh, share with them. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, we have two more questions, then we'll um, have our people speak. Okay. Thank you. My name is Atanas Baizire from the UFIGF DRC. <coughs> First, allow me to thank the UCA. I'm one of the young uh, people who have benefited from the uh, support last year of the UNECA, and that has been instrumental in my career and entering this ecosystem. My, my, I've come to realize that uh, African initiatives, whether NRIs or digital initiatives, are easily getting uh, financial support ex-Africa, ex like external Africa than within Africa. So I want to know what are the measures that we want to take to make sure that our digital uh, initiatives, our NRIs are getting support and finance within Africa than out of Africa. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Kosi, and then we have one speaker online, one question online, please, um, technical crew, be ready. Th thank you, Chairman. I'm Kosi Amesin from Benin. I'm from Ministry of Economy and Finance. We start African NGF since 2011. We have more African country where we don't have any national IGF. What is the plan to help them? The some countries are make it, but since two or three years, we don't see anything again. What is the plan to help also that countries? That is my question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The speaker online, please. All right. Thank you very much, Pons and uh, Mekta Sorin and all the panel um, uh, members here. Uh, my name is Abraham Fifi Selby. I'm a Ghanaian. I'm currently speaking um, from London in the United Kingdom. Um, I have been um, volunteering for the Global IDF as a technical support and the IDF Secretariat um, since 2020. And um, I also last year got an opportunity to join the UNECA as a volunteer where I um, helped so much in terms of mobilizing all the volunteers from different African countries. Um, it was a very good journey because looking at the concept behind it, bringing people from Africa to work together. Not only that, but um, UNEC also created an environment for us to also work together with the staff at UNEC, which was the very um, best of um, exposure for all these youth in Africa. Not only um, the aspect of um, creating um, an environment for the internet governor, because there are some questions people have asked that I want to clarify based on that. People, we try to let people understand that most people didn't even know about internet governance, but they were selected. We gave them opportunity. Then we started um, training them to get involved. They understood the system. Now, we also got a chance to um, leverage internet governance processes to their various countries. So um, we have to pick people, especially creating the gender equality among them. We started picking people to train them. What we realize is that people lack mentorship within the internet governance space. So if people who are already versed in the internet governance space, we try to tell them that the internet governance forum process is not about getting a travel support to travel, but also trying to create something within the space which, is, which can be beneficial to your country, to, you, to everywhere that you stand. And me, through these all processes, I've been able to get an opportunity um, out there um, very much. I also, um, led with um, other facilitators from the UNECA to benefit it, and we started training people on internet governance and under the Pan-African Youth Ambassador for Internet Governance. We received over 2,000 applications from different countries, over 52 countries in Africa. We realized the language barrier, so we tried to work together to make sure that we have five languages, which is English, French, Portuguese, Swahili, and Arabic. How can we tailor this kind of languages in terms of internet governance to the local level for them to understand? And we got to train about 1,100 people. Over the last um, three days, we've issued over 1,000 certificates to people who completed the task. We assess them, we also create an impact. Most of the youth that they were new to the system, we tried to engage them to their various local IGFs and the youth IGF. 
I'm very happy that Atanasi um, um, talked about the concept that he was part. He's been able to set up the youth IGF in his country, not only to travel, but also to create an impact. So uh, within PIA, within the youth processes of um, under the UNECA, we are trying to um, combine the people who don't have experience. But what I also suggest, based on the um, leadership, people who are into internet governance, is that it's, it's not always about providing funding for people to travel. Let us pick the people that they are coming within the internet governor because we cannot go down to do much of the work. We must bring all these people to join hands, mentor them. Currently, I have over 50 people that I am mentoring. Please round up, please. Yes, yes. So I have over 50 people that are mentoring in Africa, whereby I'm training them, giving them an opportunity, how they can also um, contribute to the internet ecosystem. And Atanasi is part. Most of them have joined various internet society programs and African um, digital programs. And what we are trying to do is that we also want to create more women into it. So this is what we have been doing as a PIAC and as an African youth. And we've been very, um, 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 we've had a privilege to um, get much from the UNEC and we thank all the leadership that they should continue to expand support, travel support and, and fund people who can contribute positively to the internet ecosystem. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, um, Sorin, um, you have some interventions, then Oneka, Halaji, then Makta, then we we'll allow our minister to close this session for us. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Pons. Um, I want to start uh, the question from um, Emmanuel. Uh, he bundled down so many questions. Those questions are critical questions. Uh, when we wanted to embark on the youth um, initiative for internet governance, we wanted to critically think. Uh, there are so many uh, youth-led initiatives. Uh, as uh, I think Ponselet mentioned, most of uh, the initiatives are supported by GIZ. But what we said is, yes, African participation is good, Youth participation is good, but the, the participation cannot be the few handful 20 people who always get exposure over and over. So what we said is inclusion is important. That means we have to distribute. Whoever that we're going to invite, it has to be in the five corners of Africa. That means the north, the south, the east, the west, and central Africa. That means you have to consider the language, and the other thing is even the maturity level of internet governance. If you look at the West Africa, it is a very matured NRI compared to the SADC region, the southern uh, regions, even the Portuguese-speaking countries. So we received an application. The, ad uh, the advert was for two weeks. We received a 1,000 applications. So we had to come up with a strategy. How do we balance, meaning, there are matured uh, internet governance ambassadors who have been in the system, but also we have to hold the hand of the people who came from, let's say, to have never heard of internet governance. But if we are always focused on, let's go back to NRI coordinator and they should nominate, then we keep on opening opportunity to the same kind of people, which is failing us. That's why we are not even growing <coughs> the NRI community in Africa. Uh, Atanase was... Um, a volunteer from DRC, for example, they hold the first uh, internet governance youth forum in DRC this year. Those are the success we want to see. It's not about traveling, as you say, traveling, but mentorship and holding each other and the network need to be east to west or north to south. How do they become together and create a network? So if anybody wanted to create a youth forum or even at a school level, IGF community, how are they going to build? Language is very, very critical. Uh, the Pan-African Youth Ambassador, for example, Fifi was uh, talking about, it was born out of the youth volunteer of the AT. We said, if we want to truly empower the youth, you have to go back to the language issue. Most of the concept is far from what the African used to understand. So language is the key. The first African language we introduced was Swahili, because that's the most popular one. If we truly we are serious about meaningful engagement, we need to go back to our mother tongue and start building our concept and uh, uh, 
in our tank that is close to our community. Um, NRI participation on selection process, as I said, we had two uh, selection criteria. The one is people are already active from NRI, so they have to create attestation from, from wherever they represent. But also we created a, a forum to say, even if you are very new from the forum, like uh, people from Lesetho uh, uh, covered, who never even have IGF, it is their first time. Ethiopia, we had 50 representation. Ethiopia never had even national internet governance forum. So it, just to balance and for them to bring together. The result is now they have the youth forum in Ethiopia. So we had to create those kind of balance. How do you measure impact? The measure impact is most of um, the fellows or the volunteer who have been in the ECA system. Now either they are facilitators or they are volunteers and I see them, they are integrated to ISOC ambassadorship, ICANN, because we still have the network keeping them together. What we wanted is not volunteer, you go your way, we keep on uh, integrating them to the ongoing conversation. That's why they are facilitators in the Pan-African News Ambassador. Thank you. Yes, um, yeah, Onika, then Malaji, please keep it short because we have 10 minutes, then Maksa, then our Honorable Minister will end. Okay, Onika. Okay, so I mean, I think it's really important for us to look at mainstreaming gender in ICT policy. So there's several things we are doing with that. We've actually developed a curriculum where we've gone uh, to different regions and different countries to train policymakers on how do you center gender in mainstream gender and ICT policies. There's a few initiatives that are happening in the continent right now that are interesting to watch uh, for. For example, Uganda um, actually uh, used their universal service uh, funds to provide uh, smart tablets to female-led households in 26 villages. We're in the process of doing an impact uh, evaluation of how impactful that was and what, you know, how, how did it change the lives of those communities and is this something that could be sustainable uh, in other areas as well. So we, we have to uh, keep trying to, to do some of this. And lastly, I will say that we are actually in the process also of doing uh, another uh, cost of exclusion uh, study that looks at it from a meaningful connectivity angle and we will be doing a deep dive on Ghana, Uganda, Mozambique and South Africa. So I would encourage you to look at those reports because th those are the experiences that women share with us that can help inform how we improve our policies and how we become intentional about including women. Remember, they are offline because they are excluded from society in general. We are not going to win when more than 50% of our population, meaning women, because they are usually majority in most countries, we are not going to win in this digital revolution, leaving half of our population behind. Thank you. Alaji. Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think in general, there's one question I would like to respond um, about the, the private sector. Um, that is the new entrance coming into the market. Um, you know, most of our countries actually, the, the taxation regime on the, on the telecom sector is really very high. So maybe perhaps that's one of the areas that we need to look at um, as in, in, term, in terms of our policies, um, just to ensure that uh, the taxation must not be a prohibition to start a business in our countries. Now, the uh, last part I just want to talk about uh, with the members of parliament is just to ensure that let's have a lot of interest in the digital transformation strategy of our countries. Because the digital transformation strategy actually is gonna uh, really uh, give us the footprint um, on which our country actually can move to the next stage in terms of um, uh, involve, and they must involve the private sector in the strategy. They cannot leave them behind. Another one also is about the digital literacy from our schools, um, from the public service, members of parliament, from the judiciary. They all must be captured in the digital literacy of our own countries and as well as also be able to identify our citizens and where they live. This is really crucial in the um, uh, ecosystem of the internet, particularly in the e-commerce, that we have started to see a lot of um, development in our GDP um, in the you know in e-commerce. E and lastly, also, um, uh, we must also encourage our government also to work together, um, because uh, when you look at the um, ministries, some ministry will be handling finance, one will be handling you know information, one will be handling. So they must be able to work together. If they work in silos, we will be in trouble. So we must work together to ensure that they understand that uh, this one country and one continent we really have to build together. Thank you. Thank you. Halaji. Dr. Sek. 
Thank you. Let me start by some question, to answer some question, not all. For the government participation, uh, we need to do more uh, to make sure uh, the understanding of the government on this uh, Internet Governance Forum. As you know, IGF is not a platform for decision. Yeah. And generally, the politics, when they want to go somewhere, they, they need to have a declaration or a commitment. There is no commitment on IGF. It is just a platform for exchange. And at the end, you will have, a, you don't have a communication, you just have a, 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 a summary not on the, on the discussion. And why we have to work uh, closely with our government uh, to give them more information about uh, Internet Governance Forum. Some know now the importance of this uh, IGF, but we, we, we have to do not more. We have uh, several platforms uh, we can use at the ECA. We have the Conference of Minister of Finance. We have also the briefing of ambassador. We have the VCS outcome. Uh, we have as a, as a the conference of minister of environment. We have several platforms where we can use to inform them. We can also work with AUC because AUC is member of the secretariat to use the STC, hmm, the ICT STC to inform better the minister on the importance of IGF. We we work also with Smart Africa, the ICT Council of Ministers of Smart Africa. We have uh, 35 uh, ministers of ICT uh, to to give them more information about uh, Internet Governance uh, Forum. And also, we, we the issue also our Minister of Finance doesn't know exactly the contribution of the digital technology on the GDP. And there is a request uh, last year, ECA, to prepare a study to measure the impact of digital technology on the, IC, on the GDP. Because when you talk about digital technology, for them, it is a telecommunication sector. They can measure the telecommunication sector because the telecommunication has revenue. But for the, all this uh, fintech, uh, this mobile e-commerce platform, this e-government service, they don't have any tools uh, to measure the impact or the contribution on the GDP. I think when the, we are working on the study, when the study will be done, uh, I think we'll, we, they will get a better understanding of uh, this uh, contribution of ICT on the GDP, plus the study uh, done under the leadership of uh, a, a team led by uh, Jimson on the cyber security and the contribution of cyber security and ICT on the GDP. The next youth participation, I think, uh, is uh, they already answered the question. I think Ponsole also was the chair of the task force. We can provide some effort. Private sector, yes, for youth, we find a way now to, to involve their participation. We have the term of reference, the criteria of selection. For private sector, we have uh, to look at it uh, under the task force. I, I, I leave the question to the task force for IGF to discuss how we can better evolve private sector in uh, the African IGF. But we have some private sector, but the big issue is the government. Now, look at when you look at the room, hmm? I think Kofi is only representative of the minister, of the government. Yeah. All other people are from civil society, private sector, academia. It is a problem. Yeah. Yeah, we need, uh, there is a lot of work, uh, I think. To have thing in your in your working group, national IGF, uh, national IGF. Uh, frankly, uh, we don't have we we can't support all the national IGF at ECA level. It's not possible. You have the regional IGF. I think the regional IGF can work with the na with the country to develop their uh, national IGF. And we have the all the five regional IGF. Uh. One network. We need to, to look at the regulation. We can we can have it because you have a one network in uh, some uh, so, so some region on the on the telecom sector. But the issue is is uh, you know there are several uh, law and regulation uh, between uh, the country, also and between anglophone and uh, francophone country. We need to work together at the EU level eh? with all this country. Uh, to, to come up with the one network. It will be possible because now with the implementation of the African free trade area, eh, we can do it. Now we have one single market. We are going to avoid, adopt uh, in January the African digital single market. And one of the key recommendations is to have a one network. And we are going to step by step, maybe not next year, 
by 2030, maybe we can have a one network. Coming also to the digital inclusion, the cost. Hmm? The problem is not the infrastructure. Hmm? The problem is the regulation and the politic, uh, political commitment. We have uh, all the infrastructure, but when we talk about sharing infrastructure, when you go to the law and the regulation side, we have a uh, we, we, ha we, 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 we have uh, all rules how to regulate this uh, uh, sharing infrastructure, but people didn't implement. We have, uh, to, we have commit our government to implement the regulation. It is a big problem now. If we come up with a good regulation and with good implementation, all the costs will, uh, will go down. Because when you look at there is no competition in the operator. You, you, have, you can have one country, you have five operators, but not, there is no competition. One have uh, one cent more, one cent less. It is just a discussion between the, the operator. And the regulation doesn't do the rail work, how the operator should implement their network, what are the tariff, the, the regular cost for the service of telecommunication. The cost is defined by the operator of service, not by the regulator, or the regulator should have the power and the competency to define uh, the cost of the service. We have a lot of things to do on the regulation, and I think uh, our regulation also uh, uh, are, are aware uh, we'll, uh, we, we can do the better to support them also, because for the infrastructure, you have this satellite constellation we can use in the continent. I'm going to, so, to, to stop there. I think I... <laughs> We have another another session, and I will leave the floor to 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 the chair. And I think all your questions are relevant, and we'll continue this bilateral discussion. Thank you. Yes. So we just close this um, session now with our honourable Minister for State for Digital Economy of Ethiopia, on Honourable Huria Alimadi, to just say a few words to close this session. Over to you, Honourable. Now you can hear me. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, I would like to thank and appreciate <coughs> all the panelists. They have talked about all about Africa. It was really uh, interesting. Well, uh, <coughs> it's my honor to be here also to hear about what we can do with uh, Internet Governance Forum as an African country. What is uh, really our role in implementing, proper uh, implementation is the most important thing. So <coughs> here, as you, uh, as you, uh, you all know, uh, Internet Governance Forum is a very uh, great uh, platform to discuss about the opportunities of Internet, new opportunities and the challenges, how we can address and the uh, new developments. As we all know, the world is very uh, dynamic and very uh, flexible, especially the digital is uh, changing from time to time. So we need to get ready as a continent. That's the most important thing. So how we can do it, how we can do it is a critical thing. So Africa is, uh, as we know, uh, youngest and most uh, rapid urbanizing uh, content with uh, its young and dynamic population. So we all talk about our young people, our future, our power, the future of Africa. So <clears throat> when we say this, well, we have to get ready uh, to work and we should consider the beyond the digital development. And it's a digital development and digital transformation as a more advanced stage of the development. So we have to uh, think of, uh, we need to understand what do we mean digital transformation? What do we mean say? So uh, there is a need of willingness to experiment and to change. So there is a need of commitment for the leadership. So we, uh, we have to get ready to, uh, to lead and to be committed 
the digital transformation. It's not only an investment. We are talking about the improving of life of our community, our society, how we can improve, how we can uh, <clears throat> improve their lives. That's all what we can talk about. So we need to provide meaningful access for digital transformation services. We need to have a digital skills in training the most as, as African countries. So we need to develop and deploy solutions to address our social and economic challenges as a continent. So we have to address through technology, through digital transformation. So we have to, <clears throat> it needs cooperation as a continent. As an African continent, we need to, to cooperate and to coordinate. To do that, IGF is a very great uh, platform. We can talk about national IGF, we can talk about African IGF. So how we can make it meaningful, meaningful for us to use in our policies, in our legal frameworks, how we can use it, especially in building the common infrastructure as a country level. We all say there is always a need of affordability. So if we are going to talk about affordability, we have to produce in our country. That's the basic solution. And if we can produce, we can use it in our content, in our own language. So it is easy to understand for our society and we can improve their lives because they can uh, understand it, it's in their own language and they can uh, afford it to, to access the devices and the other tools, the other tools of technology. So <clears throat> this is one thing that we, uh, we need uh, to do at uh, African uh, countries to, to have a solution for the affordability. Uh, so no. that's what uh, we have to... Honorable uh, Minister, please, I have to make you round up this time. A session is coming in. Yeah. Oh, okay. Is it next? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody, for coming. We'll just take a brief picture, and then we're done. Thank you. Thank you. God bless you all.